It's one of the most recognizable TV theme songs of the 20th century. A staple of 90s pop culture, and it aired on NBC once a week for six years throughout the 90s. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down, and I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Seriously, there's probably an entire generation of folks who can rap every lyric of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air's theme song from memory. And trust, I'm one of them. The song lays out how a kid from Philly got into some trouble and ends up shipped off to California to live with rich relatives. But for one filmmaker in Kansas City, the song is more than a catchy opening to a beloved sitcom. It changed his life. I was on 71 Highway. And the vision hit me in, in a lot of things, experiences I saw as a child. And just thinking about the inciting incident, right? Like the theme song laid out the stakes for you. Morgan Cooper always knew there was something about the story in the song that begged a pretty fundamental question. What really happened? You know, I got one little fight, my mom got scared, right? I got in one little fight and my mom got scared. I said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. And I'm thinking about, you know, I've seen a lot of a lot of fights on a ball court, but nobody got shipped away to Bel Air. You stayed and you and you yeah. dusted yourself off and maybe you got laughed at at school and that was it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I was like, well, there's probably more to the story. He had a gun. Boom. Just like that, Morgan had an answer to that burning question and knew he had to do something with it. He decided to produce a short film. It reimagined The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which was a mostly lighthearted half-hour sitcom, into a dramatic and gritty redemption story. You are carrying a gun on the streets to protect yourself? I've done my best, Will. But it's time for a change. You're going to Bel-Air to live with your uncle and your auntie. Bel-Air, out of all places, This is a second chance, Will. Don't waste it. The final product was three and a half minutes long, about the length of a trailer. Morgan uploaded it to YouTube on March 10th, 2019, exactly three years ago today, and he called it Bel Air. Take your time. Go deep. At the time, Morgan was a young commercial cinematographer living in his hometown of Kansas City, Missouri. You know, I represent the 816 all day. Yeah. That's where I grew up. It's my hometown. And so I love my city. You know what I mean? Best barbecue on the planet. Some of the best people. (laughs) So much much talent comes from my city. So now now did you grow up more like Will Smith's, you know, West Philly or Bel Air? How did you actually grow up? Yeah. So lower middle class is what I said. My parents were divorced. And so all over the Kansas City metro is where I lived. A lot of different experiences really helped inform my worldview and seeing just a lot of different things. Morgan is self-taught. He developed his filmmaking chops on the local music scene. My filmmaking journey started in the line of a Best Buy when I graduated high school. Uh, I didn't go to college. I didn't go to film school. Uh, that was not on the table for me. And um, instead, I stood in the line of a Best Buy and bought a, a, a DSLR, a, a Canon T2i, which is my first camera, and really took that camera and built a career with it. Mm. Took that camera, started shooting music videos in the hood for for rappers. You know what I mean? Shooting low budget music videos to cut my teeth, and that was my clientele. You know, just uh, you know, being able to learn and learn how to adapt quickly, and you know, work under high stress situations. Uh, you know, that's really how I started my career. Morgan was 28 years old when he came up with the idea for Bel Air. As soon as he started writing the script, he knew. He was on to something. When that idea hit me, man, I saw all of it. It's it's easy to say it now that it's real and the show's out, but like I knew it was something special and it was just like a mo- like a really, really special, like magical feeling that I had. I, I think there's no doubt that as soon as it dropped, so many of us were like, yo, this is something, this is something special. Man, but you. when did you realize that like, yo, this was something, that we got something here? I can tell you exactly when. The moment I really knew I think this thing is really out of here was the very first take of shooting it. We were at my cousin Charlie's house, RIP my cousin Charlie. Mm. And uh, it was the scene with Will and Vi on the couch that that begins the trailer when she tells him, mm-hmm. you know, she's like, look at you. 
the only reason you're not in jail is because your Uncle Phil called in a favor. Like that scene right there was the very first scene we shot of it. Look at you. Look at you. The only reason why you're not in jail is because Uncle Phil called in a favor. And I just remember being behind my camera and looking at it and I said, this is out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Period. It's done. The day after Morgan's short film dropped, even before it went viral, and trust, it went viral, he got a call. But not just any call, a call on behalf of the Fresh Prince, Will Smith. It was less than 24 hours when Will and Westbrook reached out. That's crazy. They reached out less than 24 <laughs> hours. Crazy. So it, was, it wasn't even like super, super viral yet, bro. It was like at like 150,000 views or something like that. So it was getting traction, but it was like day two when it was out of here. Day two was like 2 million. The next day, 3.5, crazy numbers. But they reached out pretty early on. And I remember going up there meeting Miguel, his manager, and Lucas Kaiser over at Westbrook. And Will was on FaceTime. And he was down in Miami doing Bad Boys 3 at the time. He had prosthetics on his face looking crazy. Mm. And he was just like, yo, bro, oh my God, Morgan, this yeah. is crazy. Like, yo. Like, he was just like geeked out over it, right? And, and you know, I was just, just so excited that he was passionate about the vision right off rip. And he asked me point blank, he was like, all right, so what do you want to do with it? And I was ready. I was ready. That's a big question, though. That's a big question. What you want to do with it? That's a, that's a big one. A big question. And you got to be ready in those moments. Those are the moments of truth. And, and I pitched my vision right then and there. I said, you know, I see this as a one-hour drama. Hmm. And he said, okay, come down to Miami in a few weeks. And so I did. And we had kind of an unofficial development session where we talked about the show and the vision. And he had so many great ideas and, and his enthusiasm for the vision. It was just, we were just bouncing energy off each other down in Miami. And we shook hands at the end of the trip and said, Let, let's do this. Let's get into business together and make this thing real. And the rest is history. With Will Smith on board, the team shopped the idea around and eventually found a home at Peacock. NBC streaming service. The show was greenlit for two seasons. What's more, instead of just selling his idea to a big Hollywood studio, Morgan stayed on as a writer, executive producer, and director for the series. And this year, Bel Air premiered on Peacock right after the Super Bowl. Game ball goes to Will. Way to bring it home, young boy. Yeah. Don't forget your day ones when you in Virginia living that D1 college life. Man, you know I'm a rep West Philly wherever I go. Real rep. Yeah. Hey, first day on campus, you know what, John, you got to hit him with, right? What? Hold on, wait a minute. Hey, 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 hey. Hold on, wait a minute. Hey, hey. I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. This is a story all about how a viral video turn someone's life upside down. And we'd like to take a moment, so just sit right there, and we'll tell you about the significance of a show called Bel Air. And we're gonna create something that is originally ours, that's timeless, it stands on its own while still honoring those iconic characters from the sitcom, and that's what we did. Will Smith wasn't the only member of the original cast that loved Morgan Cooper's short film. You, you know what I think? I think... Morgan did a very genius thing. This is DJ Jazzy Jeff. He played jazz, Will's best friend and partner in crime on the original Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Him coming from a non-Hollywood point of view, I think that level of authenticity, there's something about this show that you're kind of like, I can see that. Yeah. To the point that I may have that person as my friend. I may know that guy. Mm -hmm. I think... Someone is bringing a level of realism to this show that is very, very relatable. For Jazzy Jeff, seeing the new show come together has been surreal. This is the Twilight Zone. You know, I've been telling mm. people that I'm still wrapping my head around the fact that I was on the original show and that the original show has lasted 30 years. Mm. Never in a million years did I envision me doing the show in the first place. So actually, never in a million years would I have envisioned us getting to a 30th year reunion and then turning around and now I'm watching someone play a character that I couldn't even believe I played the first time. So this is a major Twilight Zone moment for me. A good Twilight Zone, though. But 
Yeah, this is I'm I'm living in a, another dimension right now. Jazzy Jeff is one of the most prolific DJs in the history of hip hop. He got a start in West Philadelphia, where he was one half of the duo DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince with Will Smith. In 1989, the two won the first ever Grammy Award for Best Rap Performance for Parents Just Don't Understand. The song is catchy and a little corny, pretty different from a lot of rap at the time. And that helped push Jazzy Jeff and Will Smith, and hip hop for that matter, into the mainstream. I asked her for Adidas and she bought me zips. I said, Mom, what are you doing? You ruined my rap. She said, you're only 16. You don't have a rap yet. I said, Mom, let's put these clothes back, please. She said, no. You go to school to learn, not for a fashion show. Will Smith had always told Jazzy Jeff that he wanted to be a movie star. Jeff, he just wanted to make good music. But when Will got the opportunity to star in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, he wanted to bring his homeboy along for the ride. So him, you know, him basically tricking me into doing The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air because he came to me, you know, in the beginning and said, hey, they want you to be on three episodes. And I was like, nope, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I do music. And he basically looked at me and he said, listen, do one episode. If you love it, you got two to look forward to. If you do one episode and you hate it, you only got two to do. Mm-hmm. I looked up and six years had gone by. So I really wow. got to give thanks to Will for having the foresight of don't just say no because it's not what you want to do. This is going to get you to the point that you want to get to. It just might not be through the door that you thought. To get to what you want to do, you might have to come in a window. Jazzy Jeff's character was a crucial part of the show. As a musician from L.A., Jazz poked fun at the bougie Banks family, sometimes saying what we were all thinking. And he gave Will's character a friend from his world. There is a young gentleman downstairs with a rather large radio who is here to see you. He claims his name is Jazz. Yo, word up, set him up. From the very beginning, Jeff was a standout. I walked into that show with zero expectation, zero idea. They gave me a script, I read it, and everybody laughed. And I was kind of like, I have no idea why everybody thought it was funny, but I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Someone came up with the idea that Jazz would push Uncle Phil a little too far. And in his very first appearance on the show, Uncle Phil grabs Jazz and tosses him from the house. The oboes will be coming next. (laughs) and everybody laughed and then someone wrote it again and I got thrown out again and everyone laughed Ah! and then it became you know what he's going to come in he's going to do something he's going to say something that's going to get him tossed out of the house and it kind of became a a a staple in the show Ah! As the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air became a smash hit, Jazzy Jeff says that his real life started to imitate the art. He was spending time in LA, getting successful, and his eyes were opened to a world outside of West Philly, where he grew up. It it took a second for me to understand. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was about someone in West Philly ended up going to Bel-Air having to readjust his life and understand that it was a bigger world than Philadelphia. Hmm. People don't realize that Will and I going out to California to do the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was that same exact story. We were two guys from Philly that were doing music that all of a sudden we're on a television show in LA having to completely change our lives and realize that there is a much bigger life than Philadelphia. Hmm. You know, no disrespect to how we came up, but I'm pretty sure if we had an option for it to be different, we all would have picked that option. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get so mentally locked in that you don't believe that you have an option that it's kind of like, yeah, this is where it's at. You don't understand. This is the greatest place in the world. You know, Mm -hmm. the mind will kind of play tricks on you and tell you that, Keeping it real is keeping it where you are. 
What do you miss most about the show in, the, in those days? It was really a family type atmosphere, hmm. especially me being so far away from Hollywood coming in. And this was us being transplants from Philadelphia going to L.A. It really helped having a family type atmosphere because it didn't feel like you were missing something. You worked with these people, you ate with these people, we had a good time with these people. And I think that was the one thing that I missed. I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever came to grips that one day this was gonna be over. You know, I remember Mm. we were all sitting in the living room on the set and Will came down I didn't really understand why we were all sitting there and everybody was just kind of talking. It was kind of really solemn. And Will came in and said, I just want to let everybody know that NBC is going to do the show for another season. And when he said that was the first time in my mind, I said, so this is going to end one day. Mm. Like it was so Mm. second nature and so family that it was like, whoa, You know, and then I started going down the list like, wow, like television shows come to an end. You know, Will was on the verge of being the biggest movie star in the world. You know, everybody had different plans except me. You know, it was kind of like, whoa, whoa. You know, first of all, I didn't expect to be on here. But now that I'm on here, I'm kind of like, wow, this is kind of cool. And then I have to (laughs) come to grips with one day this is going to be over. The show's finale aired on May 20th, 1996. Happy birthday, Mr. Banks. Mm-hmm. Heard you had quite a Suarez last night. That's French for shindig. <laughs> What's French for unwelcome guest? And Jazz was thrown out of the Banks crib for the last time. I know that look. You're not getting any younger. <laughs> While the end of Fresh Prince was hard for Jazzy Jeff, it also meant he could go back to music full-time. And the sitcom had made him a household name. Television, you have 80-year-old white women come up to you and say, that's jazz. Hmm. And I'm like, that's a whole different thing. And then they were like, oh, my God, didn't even know he DJ. Oh, my God, he's pretty good. I didn't know he made music. <laughs> so it was a lesson that you got everything that you wanted out of it. It just came in different directions. Jeff was able to take his DJing to the next level and get to the point, I'm sitting here like, my brother was in the Vietnam War, and I'm playing Biggie in Vietnam. Mm. Like, there were so many head trips. I I grew up in Southwest Philly. I'm looking at Table Mountain in South Africa, and music is what got me here. The pandemic put a pause on his world travel, but Jeff doesn't mind. He's able to spend more time with his family and do things like host a brand new podcast dedicated to all things Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Hey, I am DJ Jazzy Jeff from West Philadelphia, born and raised from the original cast of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And I am super excited to talk about this show. Jazzy Jeff is a fan of the new Bel Air. He feels like creator Morgan Cooper has done a great job of capturing the Philadelphia that he knows and loves. I remember when I watched the first pilot, the first glimpse of music that came on gave me goosebumps Mm -hmm. because I was like, I have never seen anything on television to represent Philly as authentic as this. And they nailed it. Mm -hmm. Even the, the, the scene with the guy riding on a bicycle was five blocks away from where I grew up. And I'm looking at the stores and, and I'm like, yo, you did it. You did it. Like if, if there was ever a way to capture the true essence of Philly, especially in 2022, he did it. When we come back, show creator and director Morgan Cooper on some of the creative choices behind the new Bel Air. And we'll speak to the actress who plays the new Aunt Viv, Cassandra Freeman. We just kind of feel like, you know, the ancestors' hands are on top of this show in general. We'll be right back. As Bel Air was coming to life, 
Morgan Cooper was intentional about every detail, from the Black artwork in the Banks' house, to the music choices and the fashion, to the slang and haircuts. He wanted Bel Air to feel authentically and unapologetically Black and true to the culture. That included filming the Philadelphia scenes in Philly, not on some random lot or set in L.A. That's that's the one thing. I grew up in in South Jersey, right across the bridge from Philly, so I was always the gallery. We was in Philly all the time. Mm -hmm. And I loved hearing Young Boy, right, and the John, Mm -hmm. then hearing Freeway and then seeing Freeway. What was that experience like, immersing yourself in Philly, Philly? Bro, I love Philly so much. Yeah. We had to be there. We had to be on 60th and Market Street. We had to tap in with Bike Life Rex and get the young boy there. Mm -hmm. We had to tap in with Freeway and make sure that he was involved Mm -hmm. because these are the things that in our show, Will Smith wakes up to every morning. We have to see those things and be intentional about putting those things on screen. Beyond the feel of the show, Morgan wanted to use the longer series format to accentuate dynamics that he loved from the original but give them more weight and space. One that resonated with me was the theme of manhood and what it means to be a black man in America. These ideas were present in The Fresh Prince, but in Bel Air, they feel fuller. I think it's important to show black men supporting each other, black men connecting with each other, black men hugging each other, you know what I mean? Just showing love to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I think those images are really important on screen. I, I think. Growing up, you you just didn't see a lot of that on screen. It was just like, you know, the violence, the drugs. And it's just like, nah, like, that's that's not what I woke up. Like, it was love growing up with my bros, you know what I mean? Like, and, and tell my brother, I love you, bro. Like, tap in with me when you get home to make sure you sit. Like, that was the type of energy that it was. And, and I think we need to show that type of camaraderie and brotherhood on screen. And that's how we make a meaningful change. Because that's that's what's really real. It's just not shown through media. All they want to show is the negative. We have to be the ones to change the narrative and show like, no, our existence has far more dimension than you guys want to show. And so we're going to be there to show the power of brotherhood and the power of friendship between Black men. Morgan says from the very beginning, he wasn't trying to recreate the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. He wanted to tell Will's story in a way that was familiar, but was clearly and defiantly a product of its time. Listen, you can't do The Fresh Prince again. That was a once in a generation, once in a lifetime thing that they did. And so to try to reboot, you can't do it. This show would have failed. It would have been terrible. I wouldn't have wanted to watch it, that's for sure. The, The whole goal was like, how can we honor the spirit of these characters, right? While completely making them new and dimensionalizing them in a way that you couldn't do in a half hour sitcom 30 years ago. So right off rip, it's like all due respect to the sitcom and what they did. But our job is to, you know, create iconic moments through this show. And we're going to create something that is that is originally ours, that's timeless, that stands on its own while still honoring those iconic characters from the sitcom. And that's what we did. So that meant finding the right actors to resurrect and reimagine all the characters we loved from back in the day by taking them out of the fun-loving 90s and into now. I just feel so considered. Like someone thought, it's important that Aunt Viv's a real person. I feel like all of Bel Air in general just feels like, listen, we thought about that and we are trying to be intentional. Cassandra Freeman plays the beloved matriarch, Vivian Banks in the new Bel Air. Cassandra is the third person to play on Viv, following Janet Hubert, who was in the first three seasons of The Fresh Prince, and Daphne Maxwell-Reed, who was in the last three. It would be hard to come in as the second or even the third and think people would forget the first. You know, if it's mm-hmm. like a real family in a way. Whoever is your mother to start off something, you're like, that is who it is. Don't be over here trying to say that you're my mama, okay? I already got Uh, a mama. Sit down. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we're fans of the shows, too. So I feel like in a way we're like anti-collectors where we're like, you know, let's put on our white gloves and really take care of the legacy because it's their legacy and we're just here to try to elevate it to this world of drama. On top of trying to honor the original show, 
Cassandra had the added pressure of joining the ranks of iconic Black mothers on television. The confident, elegant, educated, loving, but no BS Black mothers. TV moms like Florida Evans from Good Times, Louise Jefferson from The Jeffersons, Lisa Landry from Sister Sister, and of course, we can't forget Claire Huxtable from The Cosby Show, who is probably still the epitome of Black TV moms. Mother, all my friends are wearing makeup. Vanessa? Rebecca's mother lets her wear makeup. I am not Rebecca's mother. If you want to live with her rules, fine, go live in her house. Young lady, I do not want to see you in makeup, is that clear? Yes, Mom. Good. Cassandra has been acting since 2001 with appearances on shows like Atlanta, The Last OG, Luke Cage, and Blue Bloods. But the role of Aunt Viv and everything that would come with it was uncharted territory. By the time the role actually came my way to even audition for it for the first time, I was like, you know what, I can't do that. No, no, <laughs> who gon'? And so by the time I had an interview with Rashid, the showrunner, and Morgan, the first thing they said was, like, you are not here to fill those shoes. You're here to create new shoes. It's like a new mm. world in a way. And that freed me up. And then I thought, oh, well, then let's go create something. What did you think about the, the portrayals of the first on Vivs? And what did you take from them? And what did you kind of reinvent? You know, my background is in theater. So it's like a part of my nature to always look at who are the predecessors who stepped into certain characters, into certain roles. And I always look at that as a way of seeing like, what did they do that we should keep? And what's something that I feel like I could naturally bring to the role or mm. help elevate the role, especially now it's in a drama landscape. Janet Hubert and Daphne Maxwell, they really epitomize the idea of like the queen of aunties. And so I thought, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And I thought that means that is someone who's loving and caring. I think those women portray like the consciousness and heart of the show. So for me, the way I embodied that is when I can be loving, then I really want people to feel like I'm deeply listening. Mm -hmm. I'm not distracted. I'm grounded in the other person. And if I can touch them or caress them, that is what I'm going to do. So that way the audience at home can still feel that Sort of, you know, I'm a Southern girl anyway. Like, that's that Southern love. Of, like, I got to put hands on my baby to know that, you know, I'm a weak. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the things like that. There's so much space. Ah, yeah. Well, I know it can feel overwhelming, but don't worry. You know your way around here in no time. Until then, uh, can I get a map of this, John? Oh, there's that Philly swag. Oh, I've missed it so much. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I couldn't pick you up from LAX myself today. Oh, no, it's all good. I see you got a party going on. I wish it was as fun as a party, but... Forget all of that. Are you all right? I mean, after everything that happened. Yeah. It's all good, Aunt Viv. You know, got in one little fight. My mom got scared. I'm just so happy you're OK. And then the things that I wanted to bring was to make sure that she felt like she was still grounded in that Philly sensibility. Like, she didn't lose herself and like she's in this world. I did not want that for her. And that was the mm -hmm. first thing I talked to Morgan Rashid. I said, I felt like if I owned her, she has to feel like she's grounded in where she's from. And the way that Jada Pinkett, you can feel that girl is still from Baltimore, even <laughs> though she's surrounded by luxury. And I thought that's the same type of lifestyle I wanted to bring to her, or the same type of essence. In both shows, Aunt Viv is married to the wealthy Philip Banks and mom to Hillary, Carlton, and Ashley. But she's Will's mom's younger sister also originally from Philly. So she's the only one who truly understands Will's two worlds. Aunt Viv has always been a source of love and strength in the Banks family, but all three Aunt Vivs have been very different. Janet Hubert was outspoken and fearless. Now, officers, I'm sure we can clear this whole matter up quite easily. Could you please sit down? We're busy now. Oh, honey, we're about to get very busy. <laughs> While Daphne Maxwell-Reed was warm and steady. I cannot believe that you and Carlton are moving into your own place. Seems like just yesterday when I was wiping the tears from his eyes. No, no, that was yesterday, Aunt Viv. I told you that boy wasn't ready for Jurassic Park yet. <laughs> Cassandra wanted to create an Aunt Viv that we could all recognize, but also someone who fits in 2022. I messed up. I owe you two everything. You want to repay us? Be the Will who charmed West Philly with his swag and his talents. 
Because if that will turns up at Bel Air Academy, it won't be long before you run in that John. In Bel Air, the character is more fleshed out and complex. This Aunt Viv is no longer in the shadow of Uncle Phil or just a shoulder to cry on for Will. She braids Ashley's hair, has deep conversations with Hillary, and hosts parties with her sorority sisters. She's also an art history professor, wrestling with her identity as a politician's wife, a mother raising black children in white and wealthy Bel Air, and her former career as an artist. In one scene in the new show, Uncle Phil and Aunt Viv meet some donors for Uncle Phil's campaign for district attorney when a woman recognizes Aunt Viv for her artwork. Uncle Phil quickly chimes in, minimizing his wife, saying she used to be a painter. Why'd you say I used to be a painter? Hmm? Oh, I just meant you're not currently painting at a professional level. You're an ex-artist. Artist don't cease from being an artist even if it's been years from their last work. I really appreciate that that's where they started Aunt Viv. I mean, it's in our culture to automatically make Black women become the archetype of strength. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. We are fragile people. We are people who want to be taken care of as well. You know, we're as light and as sensitive as you would think any little, you know, skinny blonde woman is too. So our skin always seems like it, it doesn't take pain. We do take pain. And so what I love is that you see like a little bit of that discomfort in her. And what happens? It's like a splinter. And that splinter keeps growing until it gets infected. Mm-hmm. And she's like, we're going to have to do something about it. I think it's wonderful to see. I think it's that a part of the statement for me for Aunt Viv is that it is never too late to begin again. You know, it's never too late to reinvestigate who you were as a younger person and invest in that, right? And that's mm-hmm. a big part of her journey. And when that happens, people are gonna get a little uncomfortable and uh, they're gonna mm-hmm. have to have conversations. And I think the conversations that you see that will come out in later episodes with Phil are just such grown people, loving, warm, challenging conversations of what it means to be married, to have sacrifice, compromises, the challenges, and what you wish the other partner would have, could have done. You know what I'm saying? So I just love that's where they started because you're right. The original, it was like she is together and she knows everything and everyone's standing back. I love that the new version is like, maybe I do have more things to learn. Because um, mm-hmm. that's real. I mean, that's, that is. that's much more real. It's like this whole show is just a remix. It's like all the things you love, it's just remixed a bit, but the flavor is still there. We're marching down the but one of the most dramatic changes in character is Carlton Banks. In the sitcom, Carlton was the preppy, dancing, happy-go-lucky rich kid who bickers with Will. See, now that's exactly why people be pushing you down the steps, man. <laughs> Carlton. Oh, I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! Oh, I'm out of here. Carlton! The new Carlton is much more layered. He's still a privileged rich kid, but now he's super popular at school, he gets the girls, is captain of the lacrosse team, and is junior class president. But he's also angry and calculating and cunning. He struggles with anxiety and his identity, and he's much more confrontational with Will. There's one scene where Carlton is in the boys' locker room with his white teammates, and they're all singing along to rap lyrics with the N-word, Will walks in and confronts Carlton and his boys. And later, Carlton still doesn't get it. Day one at Bel Air Academy, and you're already playing the race car. Hell Good yeah, job, Will. The race car, Carlton. Yo, so let me get this straight, man. You really don't have a problem with a white boy saying nigga right in front of your face. It's just a word, dude. Chill out. No, I ain't chilling out. Your boy Chad was wilding, yo. First of all, his name is Connor. Connor, Chad, Rad, whatever the f- His Wonder Bread-ass name is, he ain't with the culture, Carlton. And clearly you ain't either. You're really flipping out over a word that black rappers sell to millions of white people like Connor every day. And you expect him to not say the words that they're listening to? You could write a whole book on Carlton 1.0 versus Carlton 2.0 and Mm. why they look the way they look for mainstream to understand that character. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us in the culture, I think we understand. I think some of us in the culture, it's still hard to 
understand because you might have to face what it means to treat a little black boy the way that he's been treated. All of his life surrounded by these white people telling him, just like people have told me, oh, you're pretty to be a dark skinned girl. Oh, you know, you're so smart to be black. Wait a minute, where did you grow up? Like all of these things where you have to constantly reaffirm your education, your upbringing, that you're clean and good and kind is actually part mm -hmm. of what it means to be black, not outside of what it means to be black. So if you start young enough with any individual, what type of self-hate are you creating for them to not even mm -hmm. want to be a part of their own culture? And I'm not even saying that's all true for Carlton, but those are uh, a lot of, you see a lot of those strokes in him. Without giving anything away, I think folks should go, you know, watch this show. It's, it's really brilliantly done. And it's, again, enough of the past that you feel, it feels familiar, but a nice departure from what we thought we knew. Was there ever any concern about, like, do we going too far? Or is there any, was there ever any conversation about, like, do we really want to go there with <laughs> Bel Air? In a way, no. And in a way, yes. We really wanted to honor the essence of what that show meant at that time and what it can mean for this generation moving forward. It's no yes, because we're not doing a comedy. And the thing about tragedy and comedy is that Tragedy and comedy, you know, they live next to each other. Rich Pryor can make a joke about being set on fire. That is tragic, but you twist it just enough so you can stay light. And this, we're like, we're not going to twist it. Mm. Instead, we're just going to live in the reality of it. And I think for some people, it might be really uncomfortable to have to deal with what the real essence of truth is. And so I feel like this show is like, it's like the best of soul, where it's like the A part is joy, but the B part is sorrow, and together it's just soulfulness. So, you know, it is dark, but something about it also feels life-affirming, because through struggle, you always can get to the light. Another choice that sticks out in the new Bel Air is the complexion of the cast. You know, one other thing that's going to make a lot of people comfortable and some folks uncomfortable is how beautifully brown this cast is, right? There, obviously, we know in our community and even in the industry, there's wrestling over issues of colorism that people see and some don't see. But this cast is so beautifully brown, right? Uh, what was it like to sit in that and portray that? We don't often get a chance to see that. You know, you know, it feels like a warm bath. You know what? It's real warm. First of all, I love baths, everybody. Okay. It feels good. It feels, it feels so good to luxuriate in that and to uh, hold up the banner that, you know, we all know Black is beautiful mm -hmm. and the spectrum is beautiful too. I mean, in general, if you have any issues with not knowing how beautiful you are, I feel like even stepping on our set is like a baptism of being reminded. Like, the men on my show, how much they affirm me and each other about how wonderful, talented, beautiful, right down to Maury. And Maury Cooper is the most gracious, full of humility, and like a deeply thoughtful man. And I feel like it was all, they, they did this all so intentional. And I remember being a little girl watching TV. I would watch these images and I would always think, oh, I always wanted to be an actress. And I thought, maybe the world doesn't know like, like, a brown girl, girl like me exists mm. because the messages were like, maybe I'm not as pretty, even though I had a dad who told me from day one, I'm the can tan. So I never really grew up with thinking I wasn't beautiful, but I grew up thinking, am I an anomaly? Mm. And I realized the anomaly is that it's just not put on a platform. But TV and film in America is a huge exporter around the world of what we value. You know, our culture tells people what we value. Mm -hmm. And I think what people are saying, it's like, it's so nice to see that we can say, brown skinned women are beautiful. The dark skinned men are beautiful. We can talk this way, act this way, have class, have aspiration, and do it within the spectrum of class as well. But more than just the complexity of their complexions, blackness more broadly is a feature of Bel Air in front of and behind the camera in positions of power. It's something that Cassandra says has made working on the show so liberating. People don't realize when you have all the creatives from a certain perspective telling a story, even though you don't see them, the resonance is different. It's like mm -hmm. music. You're like, you're like, why does it go deeper? And because there's subtlety to what it means to be from the African-American community mm -hmm. and from the diaspora in general. Like we get to have conversations 
without having to have the burden of translating things. That's right. Well, that, first of all, that's exhausting. And we, we deal with that on this show all the time. Like, how much do we... And we, we've long shed that, right? Like, if y'all listening, y'all listening. But that is exhausting. That's a burden that Black folks have to bear, where it's like, we're not here to educate you and teach you and hold your hand. It feels like people are talking down to you. Mm-hmm. As a Black person, when you're watching Black content and you see that they're giving you definitions and da, 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 <laughs> And you're right. like, please just stay on story. Please don't translate and we know what <laughs> shows those are right. instead we get to just be like shorthand with each other and then go do the thing mm-hmm. i mean i can't tell you how many times i would say something offhand to morgan or to one of the showrunners and then it would be in the show it would be in the line it would be in the field and i'm like y'all listen and they're like no cast of course <laughs> like so also just from the self-esteem of an artist so much of my life has been about you know using white out and putting on blinders and being like, hopefully people know I just did my job, even though the powers that be are pulling strings. And I think in this, people can feel Mm -hmm. a lot of those strings have been let go. I know when some people um, create art, you know, they want to leave it to the person who is consuming or viewing or tasting the art to walk away with what they will. And I wonder for you as an artist and part of this art project that is Bel Air, so beautifully done, is there anything that you want the consumers of this, the viewers of this to take away? I love that you call it art because that's how I see it. I think anything is art when it's this layered and nuanced and intentional. There's so many things I want people to take away. It's, it's, it's almost overwhelming. You know, I mm. hope people come here and they feel more beautiful and feel like whatever makes them distinctive was done purposefully and wonderfully. I hope people leave from this and get curious about Black art and see, you know, Devin Johnson up on our walls or, you know, Martel Chapman or any one of these like amazing Black artists and be like, oh my God, Black art? Is it really hitting like this? Because it is a moment in Black art right now too. I want people watch this and they reconsider even how they they might raise their kids. Like Mm. the way Viv and Phil have tried to raise these kids and now will I think it's through the lens of how I raise my son, which is to remind people of who they are, not of who they are not. Like, remember who you are. You're a king. I always knew that you were going to be taken care of, that you were going to be loved. Like, oh, those three, Hmm. four, five things right there. I feel that was a good enough reason to become an actress. Bel Air has given the cast and crew of the show a chance to be seen, a chance to be heard, and a chance to be understood. And for the show's creator, it's changed his life professionally and also personally. I feel like I've become more patient. I feel like I've grown as an artist, you know, within my craft, which is the utmost importance. I feel like I've grown as a man. I feel like I've grown as a collaborator. Uh, I feel like I've grown as a friend. Listen, it's, it's like yards after contact, right? Like you catch the ball, you're gonna, that hit's coming. You know what I mean? It's part of it. Uh-huh. You, you take that hit and you keep the legs moving, right? So. I've definitely, you know, made my fair share of mistakes in the process because we all have like that's filmmaking. That's the process. But you learn, you know, I remember being at the the Fresh Prince reunion that they were filming for HBO Mm -hmm. and I was sitting with the original cast and Daphne Reed looks at me and she says, like, we're passing you the baton. Wow. It is now yours. Carrying on the legacy of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is no easy feat. Morgan has taken on the task gracefully and beautifully, but like with any success, come some critics. But Morgan isn't too concerned about any of them. What matters is honoring his art and the original group of creators who have now passed him that baton. How important was it for you to make the the original creators and the original cast proud of this work, right? That they could see a reimagined, rebooted version of what they did, but also be proud of the work. How important was that for you? They're the only opinions that matter. You know what I mean, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because I just want them to know, and they've all expressed tremendous support and love for our show, which I'm so thankful for. You know what I mean? I I Mm -hmm. had a chance to chop it up with DJ Jazzy Jeff on numerous occasions at this point, and he's just expressed his love. And of course, you know, Will, champion the show since day one and loves the show and Tatiana tweeted, you know what I mean? So like that love is, that love means so much to me. I wanted them to know right off the bat, 
like I really care. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like I didn't make this to to blow up or what, like I made it because I I'm passionate about it and I love the show and I hope they feel that love. I hope they feel the the care and the craftsmanship that was put into it by you know this phenomenal cast and crew from every cameraman to every PA, COVID supervisor, production design, you know, to this amazing cast, all the background. We all love this show. You know what I mean? Mm. But this show starts with the love of what they made 30 years ago that changed all of our lives, that changed the culture. Who would we be to not take it seriously, to really make sure like you guys are in good hands and, and we love what you guys did and just want to honor it through this reimagining. And so it means the world. It really does. And uh, I get emotional thinking about it, man, because like, you know, anybody out there, you know, just know that if you have a dream and it's within you, you can do it. And, and I hope my story is living proof. You can be in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can be in, in, in Milwaukee. You know, you can be in in Delaware. It doesn't matter if it's in you and you believe in it. Mm-hmm. Pick up a camera, pick up your cell phone and, and hit that record button and tell that story. Pursue it with everything you have and, and just know that it's possible. I promise you it's possible. And believe in yourself and believe in the stories you have to tell because they're important. Bro, I'm about to get a camera, man. That was that was inspiring, bro. I'm, about to, get, I'm about to get a camera. I'm not mad at that. <laughs> To keep up with Into America, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the handle at Into America Pod. And you can tweet me at Tremaine Lee or write to us at Into America at NBCUNI.com. And if you're a fan of the show, you can now wear your love for Into America on your sleeve. Check out the MSNBC store for Into America shirts, mugs, notebooks, and more. The website for that is msnbcstore.com. That's msnbcstore.com. We'll drop a link in our show notes. Into America is produced by Sojourner Ahebe, Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, and Joshua Sarodiak. Original music is by Hannes Brown. Our executive producer is Aisha Turner. I'm Tremaine Lee. Catch you next Thursday. Thursday.